Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Put your hands up if you can. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome, everyone. It's a very interesting evening. There's a huge amount of change in government. I've just heard that um, Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, they both just handed in their resignation. So it's going to be an interesting evening ahead of us. But I think what we have ahead is actually a very spectacular evening. We have a very special gentleman joining us. And um, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to Richard Morris. You all know him, I think. He's the chief executive of IWG PLC UK. And uh, we have a very strong partnership with IWG. And Richard will talk about that. But Francesca Simoneski, uh, a unicorn entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur. Um, Francesco, may I firstly say a huge thank you. I know how busy you are. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to um, make make yourself available this evening, and it's nice to have you um, coming online from Italy. Um, so thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for inviting me, and and um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's it's great to to be here and uh, and be connected with with all of you. Thank you. So, um, Francesco, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's the co-founder and the chief executive of TrueLayer. Uh, he's a unicorn tech disruptor, and um, he's leading the financial API provider that's launched over um, in TrueLayer. But I was just talking to him. He's been involved in 50 prosperous companies as an investor, as a co-investor. He's had a huge part to play in not just TrueLayer, but the companies he's co-founded, which is three of them and then 50 other businesses that he's actively been involved in. He's grown TrueLayer um, to a thriving organization in just three years. Francesco, um, it is amazing the speed of growth that you've had. And he's raised a staggering $270 million to, in investment to date for TrueLayer. True so I'm looking forward to hearing about his incredible journey. Um, I had the privilege of, of meeting him briefly online um, last week and we actually had a very in detail discussion about people management, team management, technology, how to grow businesses and I learned a lot just in that that short session that I had with him so I think there's going to be a huge amount that we learned this evening and ladies and gentlemen I would like to make the evening as interactive as possible so please do keep your cameras on um, we want to make it like a roundtable discussion. Use the uh, reactions function or the chat function. Please raise your hand. Please feel free to ask him whatever is on your mind. The more challenging the questions, the better, because E2E is all about helping scale up entrepreneurs resolve the challenges in their business by connecting to the right people. So um, it's it's meant to be not about me talking. It's about your opportunity to talk to Francesco. And uh, in terms of the format, what will happen is uh, after I've spoken, I'm gonna ask Richard to talk about our partnership and some of the great things that IWG has been doing over the last few years. Uh, and then we'll go into the, um, first of all, I'll kick off with a few questions and then an interactive conversation with Francesco. A little bit of um, about E2E, for those of you that don't know E2E and are coming for the first time. So a very warm welcome for joining us. E2E stands for Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur Exchange. We are all about enabling extraordinary entrepreneurship and we do this in a number of different ways. First of all, it's access to leading investors, leading mentors, top class corporates such as IWG, but also very importantly, connecting founders together for you to have those private conversations. And we do that through our physical events program, our online events program, and through us talking to you about your challenges and hopefully being better than a dating agency in terms of business connections. So helping you connect to the right people. So if you're already an E2E ambassador and a premium member, I'd like to thank you for all the support that you're giving us and for talking to us. If you're not already, as a second step after this call, we would invite you to join us under the premium membership. Now, there are a lot of benefits under the premium mem membership and Richard will talk about some of the things that we do with IWG, but just really quickly, one of the key benefits is, I think one of the hardest things that I've found is talking to the right people. That's what we specialize in. We try and enable at least a couple of good connections a month 
And then you have a suite of benefits, which adds up to over £24,000 of benefits. So if you do have a hit list of people you want to talk to, I think it's us that you should send it through to, and we will try to affect those, those connections for you. And we offer a minimum of two connections a month under their premium membership, and it's priced at £25 a year. So uh, £25 a month, £300 a year. My team will shoot me for saying it's £25 a year. So um, um, if you're interested, please do look at our website, send Veronica or any of my team an email, and uh, I, I hope you'll join us. But going into the real um, ethos of E2E, I believe that knowledge is the elixir of life. The more we know the better the decisions that we make. And that's why we're privileged to have people such as Francesco um, share some of his insights and, and your questions um, with him. So um, that's just a little bit about E2E. It's a little bit about what we're about, but I'd like to hand over if I may uh, to Richard to speak briefly about our partnership. And then I will have the huge pleasure of formally introducing Francesco. Um, so Richard, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jelini, uh, and good evening, everybody. Hope that you're all well. Um, just a few brief minutes uh, from me about the partnership that we have with E2E. First of all, any of you who are wondering who IWG are and what we do, uh, International Workplace Group, basically we operate a network of on-demand workspace across 130 countries, three and a half thousand conveniently located high quality workspaces that can be accessed by the hour, by the day, or however long people wish to use our network. The idea is enabling people to work productively without having to tie themselves into long-term property leases. The pandemic has obviously had a huge impact on how people work. We think the future of work will involve less commuting, more remote work, more distributed work, it's something called hybrid working, which you might hear or read a lot about these days. And that is the idea that individuals will be given more flexibility and choice. Companies will want to harness the benefits of uh, having employees work differently in the future. And we're working with businesses all around the world to enable that. So we operate this network of around uh, 300 locations in the UK across different brands, spaces, regions, space points, clubhouse signature to mention a few. And the good news is that all E2E members can benefit from some fantastic opportunities using our network in the UK. We offer all members of E2E a special discount of up to 50% on any of our products and services. That could be a co-working hot desk, a private office, a meeting room, a virtual office business address, uh, up to 50% off. That's three months free for a minimum term commitment of six months. And also in addition to that, E2E premium members have free access to our drop-in business lounges, uh, which are in airports, shopping malls, motorway service stations, as well as across the suburbs and towns and cities of the UK. Um, so th there's some great benefits that we have on offer to E2E members. We're very proud of our partnership with E2E, and we look forward to welcoming you and seeing you in the future. Thank you, Shalini. Richard, thank you very much. And also thank you again for all of the support that you're giving, not just to us, but to our community. I uh, really appreciate that. And um, it's it's really great to see how IWG has adapted during COVID, COVID in terms of the packages that you offer, the co-working spaces. So uh, may I congratulate you, Mark Dixon and the team on that as well. Um, so now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my huge pleasure to formally introduce you to the co-founder and chief executive of TrueLayer, Francesco Simoneschi. And uh, his company, TrueLayer, it's, um, it's, it's a leading London-based technology company, which provides the financial infrastructure for developers to facilitate a range of open banking services to any business, to any business uh, around the world. 
Francesco started his first business at the age of 19 uh, after dropping out of university. Um, by the time Francesco went to London School of Economics uh, to obtain his degree in information management and economics, he has already sold two businesses and he, he was a fledgling uh, entrepreneur when he did this. He then went on to graduate with a degree in computer engineering from La Spanzia University in Rome or Roma, as I should say, Francesco. Um, over the last decade, Francesco has founded and managed over, um, invested in and managed over 50 successful tech, tech companies in the USA, in Europe, including analytics um, platform uh, Stack.IQ, IO if you know it, which was acquired by Playhaven and the mobile marketing platform Upsite. At TrueLayer, Francesco focuses on product and business strategy, building partnerships and the world's leading financial with the world's leading financial institutions. He's served recently announced he's um, truly re recently announced, as I mentioned earlier, that they've raised a lot of money. He's secured 70 million in Series D investment round, um, which was led by Addition. You probably all know Addition, bringing his total investment to 270 million dollars that he's raised. Um, TrueLayer has a market leading payment conversion rate that is 22% higher than the other providers and up to 40% higher than cards. Um, over the past 12 months, Francesco has expanded TrueLayer across 12 European markets, growing payment volumes by 600 times with plans for global expansion. TrueLayer is partnered with elite investors, including the Anthemis Group, Connect Ventures, with um, Surajit Chatterjee and with Daniel Graf. I'm just naming just a few of them. So I've just touched on a few of the highlights because this man has been a serial entrepreneur, a serial technologist since the age of 19. He took time out to complete two degrees thereafter. And uh, we are very, very fortunate to have a unicorn founder take the time to talk to you all today. So Francesco, I'm gonna say thank you very much. And uh, and start with a um, little bit around how you began your journey as an entrepreneur and what skills do you wish you possessed when you first started your business and what skills do you feel you have developed over the last few years to grow into a unicorn founder, if I may? Um, sure. So first of all, let me say thanks again for having me here and thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, I. I don't know, like, it, like the way it sounds seems like a lot of stuff, but really like I try to be as humble as possible and, and really be grounded into what I do and take like no special pride and, and just focus on doing great work. And that's, that's, I believe, like the most important thing beyond any source of track record. Uh, so to answer your question, um, I guess the first like the reason why you start early as an entrepreneur, I believe that is something about curiosity and, and try to be some sort of like self-directed, like the, the uh, it's something that I believe like it developed uh, and it's rooted into my uh, youth and, and have that source a little bit rebel if you want, just not done suffer too much fit into more stereotypical, you know, uh, path uh, and, and careers. And at some point, having to express that in some way, shape, and form, and and I think like may someone may end up into more uh, artistry and and some other maybe entrepreneurship. But but at, but at the end of the day, I think like it is a form of like creativity and try to get your voice heard out there and and even like overcome some of your uh, maybe um, you know struggle which are very typical of that age like you know you could be shy introvert and, and all of that so so I, I I'm very lucky that throughout the really the high school I I met a couple of people that were very important for my career and one of those is actually my current co-founder of Trulayer and and business partner along the years right so very successful friendship and partnership and and I feel like when you find people that are like-minded, it, it, that stimulates each other. And, and I've been really, really lucky to find people that uh, uh, helped me do just, we, we were just pushing each other's boundary. And then at some point we just got passionate the idea that, you know, you could build a company thanks to the internet, knowing a little bit of like software programming. 
then I believe like through the year, there are many, re I mean, you, 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 you acquire more like the typical skill set of in general, like you just become an adult, you may end up like studying things or just like being mentored or you just do the learn the hard way. So there are more like, I would say, um, you know, more the analytical skill set, just a little bit of knowledge, framework thinking, just learning from experience. But, but, but I believe like, at least for me, uh, the, the large, like the most important, uh, you know, uh, thing was to overcome, uh, some sort of like, um, you know, personal insecurity, let's put it in this way, like you don't, don't overly doubt yourself, but just think that you could be a leader and it's about taking risk and it's about like doing the work and, and, and just like, don't, 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 um, you know, don't be afraid if you want. And I think like when, when I started to believe in myself in that sense, then I think like things started to accelerate a lot and I kind of like get, get my neck out a little bit. And when I did that, then, you know, great things happened. And I believe like that maybe over time has been the, the most challenging, but also like the, the most impactful skills that I uh, happen to learn. Thank you, Francesca. Can I delve into a little bit of your personal DNA and your psyche a little bit more? And we talked about this briefly um, when we spoke last week. You know, uh, a lot of the people here today, we've taken investment. We've taken investment through um, funding rounds, through private individuals, through family offices, sometimes through venture capital and so on and so forth. When you are taking that investment, how confident are you that your business will be successful and how do you manage that 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 um, thinking in your mind around taking further investment? Because you've obviously raised quite a lot of money. Um, how? What is? Just talk us through. Like, are you fifty percent confident of success? Are you sixty percent confident of success? Or how does that um, play in your psyche around taking further investment and making sure that your investors get a decent return? I, I believe that, you know, great founders, great CEOs, just in general, people that end up succeeding, like they are intimately believer of what they do. And so I think there is almost like a rational and irrational part of yourself. So the rational part, it's more about risk management and you, you sometimes like you just need to recognize and acknowledge that a lot of what you do is I risk, I reward, and a lot of things can go south. And you, 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 and, and this is just like a fact, right? Like there's, there's no way to get around that. But then there is the more irrational, if you want, more emotional part, which is about, do I fundamentally believe that I, if I do A, B, and C, and D in this order, or, or, or uh, knowing this source of market or product inside, then I'm going to be successful. Or, or maybe just like try to solve a problem for myself, a problem that I did encounter in my past and I want to solve not just for myself, for, for many people. And so I think having the, that, that source of like, you need to be rational because you need to be a good business leader. But on the other side, you be a little, you need, you need to be a believer uh, and sometimes like even an irrational believer to also compel other people. I, I believe that especially in the early days, investors, they really want to see believers on the other side of the table, people that are putting their own career at the very least wouldn't say their life but certainly career at risk or a significant risk in order to venture out and and follow some sort of like um entrepreneurial journey based on what they believe is true and 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 it's good now the other side of the of the of the thing is that we we often founders we internalize uh too much, you know, that, you know, you take money, it feels almost like you are somehow an imposter of some sort, and you, mm -hmm. you just project yourself too much anxiety into that. Now, we, we all need to reflect and, and understand that on the other side, most likely there is a professional manager, a capital allocator that needs to do that for a living, almost like that. That's it's, it's their success. And maybe sometimes it's the easiest thing to do in order to create good investment return, which is like give money to an entrepreneur and they will do the hard job. Mm -hmm. And and so I think like developing that source of like sense of almost guilty or 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 some sort of like responsibility 
into, uh, you know, just like make whole your investor, uh, sometimes is misplaced. Like we need to just recognize that, you know, they are another actor of a very professional, very uh, well sophisticated and developed ecosystem. They know exactly how to do diligence businesses. They see several, um, you know, tens of entrepreneurs every single day. And if they pick you and they have believe in what you do, first mm -hmm. is their job to do it. And second, probably because you are better or anyway, they believe in you more than others. So there's no shame in doing that. And they need, and they accept the risk probably better than you do. And also mm -hmm. effectively, you have one single bullet and one single shot because like you, you need to work 100% of your time on your entrepreneurial idea they actually kind of edge on several different bets. And their, their math is that out of maybe, let's call it 10 investment that they do, mm -hmm. there's only one that is going to really, really retard the entirety and make money on their portfolio. The other nine can just go busted. So they, they, they just accept this fundamental risk probably better than an entrepreneur. They are way more edged versus an entrepreneur. So there's no shame. There's no guilty. I think like it's just a professional relationship and it's great if it, it sometimes you develop something that is more than a professional relationship, but you need to always bring it back to this is, you know, a, a person that knows what, 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 what is the risk that they are walking into and you are a good entrepreneur if you manage to, to, to explain your idea and get funded for that. Thank you. That's, I'm sure, given us, a lot of us, a little bit of comfort, because what you're saying, if I can just interpret, for us, there's only one silver bullet, and this is where we're spending our life and our time. For the investors, they're obviously hedging their, their, their bets to, to an extent by backing a few companies, hoping that one in 10 or two in 10 would be successful. So it's very interesting insight. What I will do, um, and we're fortunate, we have investors who've joined us today, is invite them to comment uh, in, in a little bit on whether they agree with that view, whether they have a different view. So we have Jeff, um, Jeff Chowdhury, he runs RCL Ventures, I'll ask him. We have also Christian Kumar of Capital Kinetics. Um, I will ask them to, to, to share their view. Um, I'm just gonna go on to a, uh, another topic and we have some technologists who've joined us today. We have uh, Yusuf, who's running not just one business, but two or three businesses. We also have um, Parang Patel of Vsauce. So I'll ask them to, to, to give their thoughts around um, technology. But um, one of the things you were saying is, um, one of the, I was asking you the secrets to your success and what has been the secret to your success. And we, we talk a little bit around, you have an underlying passion and skill in technology, do you think that is it, or do you think it's a it's a broader spectrum of things, Francesco, in terms of how you've done it continuously? And one further question is: Have any of your businesses not been successful? Um, so I don't. So first of all, I don't believe there is a secret sauce, right? Like there are just like people with personality, maybe a certain level of like risk acceptance. So you are compelled to. Uh, take some sort of like risk and high risk, maybe high reward kind of career path. There's nothing wrong into also getting another career and another path in life. And there's nothing wrong with that. I believe my secret sauce, honestly, it's more about being like resilient and, 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 and reliable into just pursuing uh, this source of like entrepreneurial goals over a long period of time and try to learn as much as I could as I was doing going through it and make sure that, you know, you, I think everyone can afford to make one mistake, but make sure that you learn out of that mistake and you don't make the same mistake exactly in the same way twice. And I think that's that's kind of common sense, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's that common sense that gets you through a, a, a long period of time. And, and maybe there's something about like curiosity something about um, I, I decided to be an entrepreneur in technology by being a technologist and, and a software engineer, which I believe it, it kind of like massively helped when you have that source of like technical skill set to really, you know, be a doer and understand uh, the nitty gritty, then it's fine if you step back a little bit on the business side, but you come with that source of strong insight into what technology 
can do for you and how to apply that and what is like the most modern or whatever the best possible way to solve a, 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 a business a business problem um sorry what was the the, the second part of your question um has any of your businesses not been successful right. um I mean, I think like, you know, success is, it seems like a very binary condition, right? Like you are either successful or not successful. The reality is that there are several different, you know, is a gradient of like being completely unsuccess unsuccessful and, and be super successful, right? So I, and that is true for me as well. Like I've done things that I would say we, let's call it like we failed gracefully. And then there are others which are, yeah, more prohominent, let's call it like more success by, you know, financially from a, from a company standpoint. I would say Trulator is certainly more on, on this part of the scale. But for instance, when I look at like the past, if I look at Stack, you mentioned that before. Now, yeah, we've been a hack we hired by a company in Silicon Valley. Now, by all means, it is a form of success. Now, if you look into that, that was really a, a mature company uh, buying a very small company for a really like the skill set of the people that were working on it. And that was the reflection of us still like a little bit going around and try to understand what was our business model, what we wanted to do. And at some point we said, you know, this is a better outcome than just keep going at this point in time and given condition and, 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 and factors. So I would say... If I compare to the success of today, then was in, in a way a, a very, a very good way of mitigating failure, right? right. Um, but but and, and, and that's how I, I think about everything. I, I, I don't believe that, you know, just I think like you can fail and fail gracefully and failing gracefully is sometimes very important uh, more than necessarily like being successful per se. Could you expand on that when you say failing gracefully just Talk, talk, talk to me a little bit more about that. Uh, I think, you know, like you need to, I mean, you, you need to take smart risk. You need to understand, like, you need to have both a personal risk profile and a more a company risk profile. And you need to, at every single point in time, you need to make the step that kind of maximizes that source of, like, trade-off between risk and reward. And there are situations which, like, you know, the risk is not commensurate to the reward and, 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 and the other way around. And so what I'm trying to say here is that, um, you know, in life, you can fail, you must fail, and everybody will fail. Now, you have a choice to fail, let's call it gracefully, that's, that's maybe the way I, I refer to it, which basically means you maximize some, some aspect of it, which could be learning, for instance, or it could be, you know, just a trampoline for another experience, right? Which, which was my case in that sense. Like I went on becoming like an executive of that company, which in turn like allowing me to do another experience in Silicon Valley, which in turn gave me uh, the, the, the kind of experience to go on and, and build through later, right? So it's, it's all like feeding into each other. So you, you can take that and say, oh, maybe it was kind of like a failure-ish because like we, we really didn't go anywhere. It was like a smaller outcome that we really wanted and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it was a good way to just like, fail gracefully, create an opportunity for the future and then build on top of that. So now I think like if you do that and you do that once, twice, three times, like you always end up being in a better state than where you initially were. And I think like over a period of time that compounds a lot and and that's what I believe like eventually is the uh, um, end state of success. Thank you. That, that, that's very, very helpful. I appreciate you expanding on that. That makes a lot of sense. I'm going to ask if I, I think, Yusuf, uh, you had your hand raised a little bit of uh, time ago. And if I could bring in Yusuf, maybe um, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind to to give your thoughts, Jeff um, Chowdhury, on on whether when you're looking at companies, whether you're actually having that equation of one in 10 will be successful. I'd like to hear your perspective. Maybe I could bring in Tarang and, and maybe Andy, you may have some questions around cybersecurity. He's doing some great things in cybersecurity. So Yusuf, please go ahead first. Uh, thanks, Shalini. Uh, and I think it was really inspiring to hear about your journey, uh, Francisco. So congratulations on your recent round. Uh, my question is, uh, about uh, how did you how do you find the co-founders for mm -hmm. your uh, company? Because I think uh, finding the right co-founder is is I think fundamentally 
the most important kind of you know factor in uh, in either the success or a kind of a graceful uh, <laughs> failure that you're you mentioning. So it would be great to understand uh, your it, thought. It, it is a tough one. It is a tough one. Like I was <laughs> trying exactly today with a with an entrepreneur that is uh, putting together a seed round and is a solo founder. And we were chatting exactly about that, right? And, and my experience in some, to, to, to a certain extent, it is, um, it is, you know, I've been like, and maybe that, it, maybe you were talking about like the secret sauce, maybe that is the secret sauce, right? Like the fact that I met a person, actually like two person that became like my best friend in life, and, you know, uh, just like I'm talking about beyond any company. And with those person, we, we just end up working together for a very long period of time. And always like, yeah, I mean, there's been like brief moments in which we all went on with other things and kind of learn. But then we always went back and we always had no doubt about how do you start your next company with, right? And, and that is rooted into friendship and it's rooted into uh, doing a lot of things that are nothing about work, nothing about business. It's about sharing life. It's about uh, all, all, all like, you know, just having, caring very profoundly for each other and learning through this, this, this kind of, um, uh, you know, path together learning about each other, how people react, like how is that you will react to my comment and just get on the same kind of like um, uh, understanding and anticipating each other's feeling and moves, right? Now, this is very hard to achieve and I understand that. So I think there could be shortcuts, like, you know, maybe some of those relationships could happen on the workplace and maybe you 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 realize that you, you have incredible an incredible feeling of working with a specific person in your current company. And, and maybe that could be the seed of like building a company of yourself, or it could, can start on your more like uh, friendship side of things. And you know, a person for some time. And so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question because it's maybe that source of like more chaotic, serendipitous, um, you know, maybe, uh, part of, of building a company that is very hard to engineer in my in my view. Yeah, I think, uh, and I absolutely, uh, Francisco, I mean, I was more trying to understand that, you know, what are the compromises that you would have to make? So if you were to choose, for example, either competence or, you know, uh, kind of, you know, it would, uh, you would really feel great, you know, working with this person, but I mean, they, they may not be very competent or really good. So like the, on, the, on the spectrum of different parameters, what, what do you think should be given the highest priority when, when choosing? A, I don't know, and I have a lot of different questions, but I'm not going to walk as a landlord here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, especially at the very beginning, like I will always err on the side of like relation and like it feels good and, you know, cultural alignment, making sure that you're aligned on your outcome uh kind of like it's, it's like dating can you make sense of like you know can you engineer like dating kind of pro no it just happens and when it happens it feels good right um i would say of course like there must be a level of competency you know be, be, because otherwise like may, maybe that's 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 um, that 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 would be an error itself but you know within a, a some sort of band of like and continuum of competency and friendship and and certain boundaries i always take more let's call it friendship but more cultural alignment be, between two individuals at the very beginning uh, mm -hmm. i think later on when you build a larger organization the source of like the reason like everything is more explicit the path is a little bit more crafted then you for instance like you can start higher executives that you are maybe slightly less culturally aligned, but anyway, like they are great professionally, but because everything becomes more, 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 more professional and explicit and, and you can live with that. But otherwise it's very hard. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Thank you. I know we've got limited time. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to move on. Before I move on to Jeff, um, I just wanted to say I'm going to come on to Alex, Nikhil, um, Andy, et cetera. So um, keep raising your hand and I will come on to you. But before I just do that, I want to welcome and um, thank Prima Gangana because she's in Washington 
she's joined us. She has taught me a lot about nutrition and staying healthy um, whilst we work. So Brema, I know you haven't got a question, but I just want to say thank you to you for taking the time to join us from Washington and to um, the, the other entrepreneurs um, from Washington. We have quite a few today. Um, Jeff, may I please come across to you just to um, see whether you agree with uh, 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 what Francesca was saying or whether you have a different point of view? Hi, uh, hi everyone, and thank you, Francesco, for your for your comments today. I just give you ten seconds of background about me and us. Uh, we are the largest um, pre-seed institutional investor in the UK. Uh, what that means in practice is basically we're often the very very first check in a company. So typically, family and angels would be the first amount of money, and then we'll be the first one on that. On that. Um, and so we're very, very early in our in our journey of investing in companies. So some of the companies we've, we've backed in the past are Monzo, Ratesetter, Palantir. These are probably com some companies that you you've heard of. Um, but I think just to uh, just to pick up on a couple of things from our perspective, uh, we very much back founders rather than businesses. Now that might seem really odd because effectively we're putting our money into a business. But at the pre-seed stage, we think the founders are much, much more important than the uh, than the businesses for a couple of reasons. One is the fact that when you're backing pre-seed businesses or at the early stage, it's it's the it's the way that the founders interact and the way that they're able to pivot and the determination of the founders, which I think is key. So we've made a few exits. We were lucky enough to have some exits, and if we look back at all the exits. It's basically the people who are determined, who are able to pivot, who are able to change their circumstances rather than had brilliant business ideas right, right at the beginning. And if you look at the ones that actually failed, and we've had a few failures as well, they look like great businesses, but the founders we were kind of lukewarm about at the point in time, and, um, and they didn't work. And then the final thing that we I just sort of mentioned is that we spend a lot of time in what we call personality profiling. So a traditional VC will have interviews with, say, six or seven times with a founder. What we do is we'll do uh, sophisticated personality profiling of the founders uh, using both quant and qualitative data, because we do think that the founder ultimately is the person who will drive the outcomes for us. Francesca, do you want to say anything on that? Um, I'm going to thank Jeff because it's it's very clear about backing founders. Um, do you want to say add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think like it it just sounds about right. And and at this point, like this is this is kind of I would say, um, I, I I think like if you look at the most successful. Uh, you know, like early stage um, um, investment firm, uh, uh, I don't know, from Y Combinator and Silicon Valley to Techstars to many other, they all went on and say, you know, look, like whatever business idea you bring me, it is just like a testament that you can generate sound business ideas more than necessarily the fact that I know that you're going to win with that specific business idea. So then the decision mm -hmm. came about, are you a great founder? with some sort of like you know overlap with with whatever is that you're you want to do and set to do and do you have a deep motivation to just make it happen on, on that specific problem uh over a sustained period of time because again like this this thing of um you know uh, overnight success they just never happen and it's uh, everything happens with a lot of hard work and a lot of residency and 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 just like accepting that there are good days and bad days. So so you need to find people that are generally interested and passionate about spending that call it like ten years of their life working on a specific problem with uh, with let's say one or two co-founders in that source of like um, mm -hmm. setup. Okay, Francesca, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. I'm going to move on, if I may, and um, thank you, Jeff, for your insights again. Um, I'm going to move on firstly to Alex, Nikhil, Thurung, um, Christian. I will also come on to you and anybody else who would like to ask questions. Um, so over to Alex Rocha. Alex? Hello. Can everyone hi. hear me? Yes, thank hi. you, Alex. Yeah, mm -hmm. hi. 
Thanks a lot, first of all, Francesco. Lots of insights and lots of uh, not only uh, knowledge, but also wisdom, I, I would say. Um, I, my question is around, you talked a lot about the skills and you talked also about the sort of inner game of the founder. Uh, my question is about scaling and teams. So how do you actually um, scale the culture that you have <clears throat> and your co-founder has to your teams so that you can actually build the organization? What are, what are, what are the experiences that you've had with scaling? Um, so, so, I mean, you, you can scale a lot of things, you can scale processes, you can scale culture, right? And scaling culture, in, in my interpretation of what does it mean, it's basically, it's basically when you are not in the room, how the other people will behave with each, with each other. That's my definition of culture. Like, when, when co-founders are not in the room, how are other people, like, when, when I'm not looking, what are the people thinking, how they behave, how they, they, they go about and I think it takes a lot of like leading le leading by example because that's that's really like maybe the 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 thing that everybody will look at like the founder and there is a there, there is some sort of like emulation of it or just saying look if the founders they 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 think that is good in some way and of course hopefully people can resonate about whether it's good for them or not but that create a a, a very strong like point of view and and. And, and just like set a behavior inside of the organization. Then maybe later on you can go about and start distilling some lessons that you believe are important to be kind of glorified, magnified and amplified inside of the organization in terms of like, um, you know, like what are the four, five, six things that really defines your like the be like this, a successful behavior of an employee of your company and that's maybe that's where you start scaling either principles like some company call it principles some other call it values uh there you know is a, is a, i don't know maybe um an employee kind of like manual or a handbook that's another way to call it uh, but but it's more ab about trying to codify if you want some specific behaviors that you find useful and you want to retain as a DNA in the organization. Now, the fact that you've write it down, it's nearly not enough. You need to like lead by example. You need to kind of like live and brief those value, make sure that people are a little bit, um, you know, whether promoted or, 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 or um, you know, fired to an extent, right? Like that, that should happen also according to those principles or values and and maybe that's the thing that you need to start you know tell people like this is this is what we we all believe and if you don't believe any of those then i'm sorry but that's not your opportunity because that's that's how this this community now um i think that you need to be flexible and hear people and there are times in which like you also need to change or you need to be inclusive in that sorts of thinking so it's very important how you set those values because may actually exclude further down the line people or behavior so you want to be really thoughtful about it but at the end of the day you know being a startup it is more like a, a, an olympic game than necessarily playing safe so you need to take some risk also on culture and just accept that mm -hmm. Alex, thank you very much. Francesco, I know it's um, 7.15. I didn't realize the time has gone so quickly. So I know that you need to go. What I'm just going to ask, if you didn't mind, is Sarang and Nikhil, can you put your questions together quickly? And I'll ask for a very short response from Francesco. And I'm sorry, guys, he needs to leave. He's got some family commitments. Um, but what we can do is we can stay on and um, we can have a chat between ourselves around any of these topics. Um, so um, if you'd like to do that, we, we can, Taran, go ahead with your question and Nikhil, would you mind? And, and we'd have to keep it very short. If you unmute, yeah. Taran, can you unmute? Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, it's unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, Francesco, very quick uh, story. I came across True Layer about two years ago and was uh, so excited. It felt like too good to be true as a solution where we were trying to round off uh, any spend that you make for a donation or something like that. So, and at that time I had a thought that this is a truly scalable, sustainable and rele relevant business. And my question is around, you know, particularly around a technology business in terms of 
how you prioritize what feature functionality you work on how your decision making works about strategic focus like today true layer does does three or four things very well but how did you decide to pick this uh, you know open banking or those integrations over everything else and how Sorry. that process Sorry. works yeah, i need to keep it short thank you Tarin. very good question nikhil do you want to ask your question and then hopefully francesco you can answer both those questions and uh, i'm sorry we've just run two yeah. three minutes over okay nikhil you unmute okay while he's unmuting do you want to quickly nikhil want to quickly answer your, answer yeah. your question sure. am i audible yes yeah, so the question to Francisco uh, is that, uh, so I, my roots are from India. So uh, India has been a very uh, digitally disruptive market for a fintech uh, business. So um, ha, um, Francisco, have you explored the Indian market and have you got some uh, key insights that have helped uh, you in your in scaling your business, uh, fintech business from India as a market, especially the UPI technology of India or the open bank system that is already, uh, you know, a startup, a unit, union um, kind of a booming business in India. So what are your key takeaways from India as a market from you, uh, from a fintech perspective? I think Tharang would have asked that question too. So two good questions, very quick response, please. Um, yeah, so let me answer the first one. So I think like you you will find like a, a variety of like great framework to, for prioritizing and, you know, setting strategy. Um, and, and, and I think like we, we'd experience you, you're, you look and learn like how to apply one and, and another. Uh, when it comes to two layers specifically, I think like we, we basically observed that open banking was a capability and nobody really didn't know what to do with that. So we said, like, let's just put it out, let's remove friction from using it and let's see what happened. And what happened is that two or three use cases clearly kind of like break out. And then we said, let's simply double down on what we see that works. And, and, and so it was a strategy of like being broad and then eventually being focused. Uh, sometimes you need to do exactly the opposite. Like you already know that you want to go very focused and most often actually going focus is the, is the solution actually. And, and, and then broaden up as you go and, and, and have success. I believe like it's very hard to have a one size fits all. It's really like context dependent. On the other um, question about India, look, I think India is a spectacular example of like how technology can really improve and scale in and just change people's lives. Like I'm thinking about incredible example like UPI, for instance, in payments and really like created financial inclusion for uh, just like millions of people almost overnight. Uh, so I'm personally extremely excited about India, very excited in general about emerging markets because you, you see that so if you want, there is an unconstrained ability of building solution and technologies without necessarily having to deal with a lot of legacy stuff. Uh, and maybe we have that problem in Europe and, and, and in the US. Now, um, specifically about layer, like, I think like we want to be a global company. So certainly India is somehow on the radar, uh, but for a, a, a different reason, starting from like, you know, like there's only like a number of things you can do at the same time. Uh, at the very moment, we are mostly focused on Europe, where we still believe there is a, a very sizable opportunity where we want to go after. And then like all those great big markets like India, Brazil, US, like they're all on the on, on the radar uh, to, to, to get there at some point in time. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Darren, Nicole. Thank you. Both very good questions. Very apt response. Francesca, we've been privileged to have your time and uh, um, and your insights. Thank you so much. We wish you continued success with TrueLayer and we hope that we can be a part of your journey. Um, so thank I think on behalf you. of everyone, I'll say thank you to you. I'm going to ask anybody who'd like to stay to stay on for another few minutes. I know I would like Andy Mills to talk a little bit about cybersecurity and uh, Christian to talk about Bye. some of his, his, his um, ways of investing. Francesco, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. And it's Bye. been like a big pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you, Francesco. Thank you. Um, Andy, uh, we're talking a lot about technology. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about the cybersecurity aspect um, a little bit about what you do and why it's important and maybe some of the, the things we need to think about as founders who have not got cybersecurity? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, 
I liken what we do to um, almost like the, the the city of Troy in that uh, we we don't at present do uh, any creation of any cybersecurity software, but we we obviously everyone knows yeah. people that do that. But you can have these big sixty foot uh, high walls, ten foot thick. But if actually some uh, some person on the front uh, on the front gate lets in this horse that's full of lots of little nasty diseases that burns the city down from within, that's um, that's what we try and prevent. So it, it, it's uh, again it, it's it's dealing with uh, you know, identifying people's gaps. You know it is uh, penetration testing with cyber. We do do a bit of that, uh, but you know basically training employees as well. So. Um, it, it, it's actually doing everything else uh, as, uh, as as well as sort of the creation of a bit of sort of a, a, you know, some some tech and some cyber to to help protect people from what is undoubtedly a an ever growing threat of um, a, a, a cyber and and ransomware and criminals out there that are testing each and every uh, businesses as they they go along not just here in the UK but sort of worldwide so. Um, for me, that's a real threat. But I was really interested about the employees as well, because most of the cyber threats that we come across or that we deal with or help companies deal with, 80% uh, of those are caused by employees, uh, and like it or not, because either they either haven't been trained, don't know what to do or, or click on you know links uh, that they shouldn't be doing. And, and it, it, it's caused from within. So um, it, it, it make no bones about it. It's definitely a very, uh, you know, a, a very sort of increasing, unfortunately, you have to say, uh, sphere of of work. But um, yeah, I, I wish it wasn't. <laughs> but, sure. Yeah. No, yeah. I think you've you've raised our awareness that we absolutely need to look at this in a lot of detail. Um, so thank you for that. And if anybody does want to talk to Andy in any um, private manner, then we will be very happy to make that introduction thank you. to thank Andy. You. Um, um, Andy, thank you. And I'm gonna just bring Christian on. Christian, you're an investor, you're a med, med tech uh, expert. You're also lecturing on entrepreneurship in Italy, which is one of the things I wanted to share with Francesco, but I will tell him <laughs> in, in a separate email. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I sort of, you know, I'm. I'm going to say at the twilight of my career, and I won't say at the end of it, but um, over the years, I've made several investments. But one of the key factors, and this is probably open to Jeffrey and some of the other investors, is if you're investing in multiple sectors, and this is a question to Francesco, was do you, you know, as a, uh, if you invest in a single sector, you've got reasonable amounts of knowledge that you learn from companies to company. But if you're like me and you invest in multiple sectors, how do you hang on to the sector knowledge so that you can support the entrepreneur that you're investing in? So that's one of my biggest challenges at the moment. Um, we run an accelerator uh, not far from where I live here in Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. And we have sector experts from various types of medtech, but it is still medtech. It's when you move from medtech to fintech to environment, mm -hmm. energy, um, how do you as an investor, and this is open to anyone, um, maintain your sector knowledge? So that was my question and discussion point, really. Okay, so I'm going to open it up. Would anybody like to give any insights on that? I know Jeff is probably multiple sectors, but is there anybody else who might want to um, to give give Christian? I think it's hard to give you advice, Christian, but I will, I will ask. Anyone? No, Jeff, may I ask you, how do you choose different sectors? It's about backing the founder, isn't it, from what you were saying? Yeah, um, I think I think Christian, uh, it's a good, great, great question. Uh, I would just say a couple of things really in answer to that. Um, it's, it's much more about knowing what you don't know rather than what you do know. So we know that we're not good in certain areas. So MedTech is a great example of an area that we know nothing about. So we don't even try to go down that area. EdTech is probably another one and probably PropTech as well. But there are certain areas of the software space which we invest in, which we know quite well. And we have three verticals, which broadly we call work, play and learn. And we have expertise. And, and I think you know we're a relatively small team. There's seven of us in our team. And we all try and keep sort of knowledge on top of certain areas within those three spaces. So I think I think the sort of simple answer is 
um, you know, try and keep on top of what you do know. And if you don't understand something or if you don't know something, actually, it doesn't matter because there's plenty of opportunities out there. Very good and sound advice. Would you agree or disagree, Christian? No, I, I agree. Um, my, I'm a bit of a maverick, so I'll jump in both feet and look for the answer later. But as I get older, I'm learning to be more sector specific. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Um, I know that everybody, there's a lot of people who want to talk to each other. If you want to stay connected to anybody else who is on our uh, online meeting and roundtable discussion today, please drop me a line and we would be happy to connect you, especially if you're a premium member. So that is um, one of the things that we do for our premium members. The other thing is, I don't know how many of you know, we've been running something called the Global Scale Up Awards. We've had applications from uh, a lot of different countries. We had a, a group of judges and I'd like to thank um, Dame Marsha Kemke, my mother. She came to judge and she's a specialist in education. Some of the other judges who are not on today, they will be there in person on the 21st of July. So we are bringing everyone together. There's about 200 people confirmed to attend. It's uh, at, going to be held at um, the Clubhouse, which is one of the IWG buildings um, at 6 30, I believe, or we may be bringing it forward to 6 p.m. Uh, and some of these judges, they include P Peter Roberts, who was the founder of Pure Gym. He sold it for 600 million. He is an investor in E2E. He sits on my board. Uh, we have Sanjeev Kanoria. Um, he is a serial entrepreneur. Many of you might know him. We have Marek Sasha, again, a unicorn founder. So we have, I think, 12 judges who are coming in person uh, and if you look at our website, you will see their names. They're coming to talk to um, the entrepreneurs and to give the awards to the 10 winners from different countries around the world. So I hope you're going to join us um, for that. And um, uh, after that, we've got a series of events from September. The one I just want to mention is uh, um, the Global Head of Innovation for Amazon. His name is Paul Misner. He's coming on the 22nd of September to do uh, a large grand scale reception with us and uh, hopefully a private dinner the, the next day. So please do look at our calendar but um, and sign up. We've got a lot of different things happening. I think a further 12 to 15 events between September and December. I'm gonna be busy chairing these events um, from then. And um, we encourage you to, to do two things. One is obviously to talk to us, but secondly is we believe heavily in sending the lift down um, sharing your knowledge with those on their a growth journey, investing, mentoring. We've got people such as Lucas here. And Lucas, thank you for joining us. He's just joined as the E2E's country director. We are growing our country director. So welcome, um, Lucas. I've had the pleasure of tasting his coffee. Um, so we are growing internationally. So if you're looking to go to different countries, do talk to us because we can make some warm introductions in Brazil, in Poland, in Africa, in the Czech Republic through our country directors. So uh, um, I know I'm on conscious of time. It's just past half past. So I'd like to say huge thank you to you all. Uh, it's been fun um, to have uh, uh, um, all of you join us. And um, I'd like to say thank you again to Richard Morris and IWG. And I'm hoping to see you all in person. Not, it's not too long to go until the 21st of July. Um, so enjoy the rest of your evening. And, and I forgot to say, Sue's here. She's our country director from Brazil and South Korea. Sue, thank you for, for taking the time. I've just seen you, Sue. So um, uh, thank you. Enjoy your evening and thanks again. <laughs>